Good morning. It's a real pleasure for me to participate with my friend Eric Lander in the 2002 Holiday Lectures on Science. Although Eric and I get to stand before you and share with you some of our views on science, much of our lectures were made possible by the creative efforts of a dedicated and talented group of uh, Institute colleagues to whom we are very grateful. Now, the simple theme that underlies almost everything I'm going to tell you today and tomorrow is shown on the screen. If you want to understand life's mysteries, what I'll call life processes, mess with them or perturb them and see what happens. Sometimes the perturbing part just happens, and we saw an illustration of that in the earlier lecture, the natural and rare mutation in the cystic fibrosis gene that gives rise to this disease. We certainly learned a great deal about the process that gives rise to the disease by identifying that mutation. But today, with increasing frequency, powerful tools of chemistry, biology, and genomics are providing for effective and specific means both to perturb life processes and to observe the consequences. I believe that these new tools are going to be key to understanding life's matrix, as well as to create the new medicines that will ensure high quality of life worldwide. So my goal today is to share with you some of these new tools that are being used to probe the genes and genomes to which Eric referred. Now these life processes can be as simple as that membrane transporter that we saw in the earlier lecture, or as complicated as the process by which a fertilized egg gives rise to a child. Understanding these life processes, of course, satisfies our um, sense of uh, mystery and desire to solve mysteries, but I think it's also key to understanding what goes wrong when they lead to disease. For example, the process by which the healthy cell on the left is converted into the cancerous cell on the right. We learned in the previous lecture that the period 1950 through 1975 provided the basic outline of life processes. We saw that genes are converted in red into proteins through the intermediary messenger RNA, and that proteins serve as the, a, a key mechanical function in mediating these life processes. This outline also gives us the blueprint for us to systematically perturb and therefore understand these life processes. During the past century, probably the most general and powerful way of perturbing a life system has been through the use of the tools and principles of genetics. We first then start with a mutation. This can be naturally occurring, as we saw. It can be randomly induced, and now even targeted. <clears throat> These mutations give rise to a faulty protein, and the faulty proteins can either be inactive or overly active. A very good illustration of this is the study of cancer in recent years, where we've identified mutations in tumor suppressors that are, render them inactive, and oncogenes that render them overly active. And again, these mutations have given us a bright light, shine a bright light on the process of cancer. And what I'm going to be discussing is a second approach. It is an approach that is grounded in the same principles of genetics, but is made possible by advances in chemistry. And so we call this chemical genetics. And here we're going to bypass the gene. We're going to start with the normal protein. And we're going to use small molecules. Small molecules that can either similarly inactivate or, in cases, overactivate the proteins to which they bind. So let's start with the first question. What are these small molecules? 
Small molecules are difficult to define. I can define the macromolecules that we've been hearing about, genes, proteins, the repeating elements of nucleotides and amino acids. Small molecules are much more complex. <clears throat> Small molecules comprise the atoms, typically carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. They're bonded together. I'll give you one illustration on the slide in various ways, in making different kinds of rings and substituents. If we can roll the first animation, I'll show you that, in fact, however, these structures are a bewildering array of different three-dimensional three shapes. And it's this different shapes that's so key to allow them to interact with the many different proteins encoded by the genome. You're looking at some molecules, you're seeing the different kinds of shapes and even atoms, different atoms that I've mentioned, boron, sulfur, chlorine. <clears throat> the first molecule I'm going to stop with here is called rapamycin. As you'll see when I discuss, it's a naturally occurring small molecule, and it's very useful in terms of teaching us about biology. The other molecules that you see now flashing before you in this collage of small molecules, showing you the many different shapes that they can acquire are molecules that were synthesized in the laboratory. They're synthetic compounds, and I'll be discussing how we go about synthesizing such compounds. The small molecule that we're going to end with today is a molecule named furosatin. I have a molecular model of furosatin for you here. We have some other molecular models of some of the small molecules flashing before you on the table. These molecular models are very useful to chemists to understand the various three-dimensional shapes that these molecules acquire. And it is their shapes that are so key for their function. And I think that the students in the audience received a little model building kit. You can have some experience in putting these different kinds of shapes together, maybe after the lecture. So having defined or looked at some of these small molecules, now we're going to ask, how do they modulate the proteins to which they bind? The first answer, of course, is that they do associate with the protein. They bind to the protein. The answer to my question fundamentally is going to be that the message that I want you to receive is that upon binding, these small molecules create a complex with a protein. And we should think about this complex as a completely new entity, a new entity that can be either inactive or overactive. Can we roll the next animation? What you're seeing here is the cellular protein calmodulin in blue. It plays a key role in a number of cellular functions. It does so by using a cleft that you can see. The cleft has now been occupied by the gold small molecule. And so in the process, we have a small molecule protein complex. You notice it has a very different shape. It is, in fact, in this case, inactive, because that cleft is no longer available for its normal cellular function. What about the case of small molecule binding to proteins that activate function? That one, perhaps, is a little bit more mysterious. It seems more intuitive how a small molecule could bind to a protein and inactivate it. On the next animation, if we could roll that one, please. You can see the blue protein is now a human protein called FKBP12. The purple protein is called FRAP. These two proteins normally do not interact with each other. You'll hear more about them later when I talk about nutrient sensing. The small molecule you've seen before is rapamycin. It has high affinity for FKBP, binds tightly to it. And in so doing, it creates a composite surface a new surface that activates the blue protein to bind the purple one. So previously, FKBP was unable to bind the purple one. By rapamycin binding to it, it creates this composite surface that now interdigitates with the purple frac protein, an illustration of how small molecules can activate function. So having defined some of the key terms and hopefully some of the key concepts, I'm going to start with an example that shows you how we use small molecules to interrogate a biological process. I'm not going to tell you about how we 
come upon these small molecules, how we identify the interesting ones, that'll come a little later. The example that I've selected is a process in cell division. All cells go through when they divide. During cell division, they create a cleavage furrow. I'm going to talk a little bit about this cleavage furrow. So you know that when cells are dividing, the first thing they do is replicate their chromosomes. They align them in the middle of the cell. The microtubule network in green tugs them apart, segregates them to opposite poles of the cell. At this stage, a cleavage furrow forms that comprises the actin cytoskeleton. What we don't know is how the cell knows when to form the cleavage furrow, where to position the cleavage furrow, and finally, how to pull the purse string on the cleavage furrow so as to contract it and pinch the cell into the mother and daughter. The next animation I'm going to show you gives you an illustration of this process. And the main point that I'd like to make in this illustration is that this is an example of a very dynamic process. The chromosomes you see are aligned, they're segregating, and the cleavage furrow is forming, and the mother and daughter cell has been created. Very dynamic processes, of which there are many in life, are very difficult to study through the use of mutations because a mutation is inherited in the cell. It's always there. And to study dynamic processes like cleavage furrow formation, you'd like to be able to turn the perturbation on and turn it off precisely with fine temporal control. This is where small molecules are so valuable. And the example that I'm going to show you is this molecule furrostatin I showed you before. This molecule was discovered by Tim Mitchison at Harvard University and was used to explore the cleavage furrow. The reason furostatin is of such interest to us is that it prevents the cleavage furrow from functioning. The cleavage furrow can form but doesn't function in the presence of furostatin. Furostatin has no effect on chromosome replication, chromosome segregation, all other processes in the cell just targeting this cleavage furrow. And one of the beauties of the molecule, as well as other small molecules, is this temporal control. You can add the cleavage uh, furrostatin prior to cleavage furrow formation, and you'll stall it right in the beginning, or you can allow the cleavage furrow to form, add the molecule, and essentially instantaneously freeze out the cleavage furrow. On the next animation that I'm going to show you, you're going to see two cells dividing. They both replicated their chromosomes. This cell in the upper right is a little bit advanced relative to this cell, and that's very nice for this experiment. When you see the blue splash, that's symbolized, that's precisely when we've added a drop of the furrostatin molecule. You're going to see that we're going to add it right after the cleavage furrow forms in the upper right-hand cell. Can we roll the film now? So here's the chromosomes they've segregated. We add the furrostatin. Cleavage furrow is frozen. These cells continue to segregate their chromosomes, but there's no cleavage furrow. So we can arrest the furrow, generating a cell either with no furrow or with an interrupted furrow. Another nice feature of the small molecule perturbation to explore biology in this sort is that these processes are usually reversible. So you can simply wash the compound out and allow the process to proceed. Roll the next one, please. So here you see a cell treated with furrostatin. Chromosomes can segregate, no problem, but no cleavage furrow. Wash it away, cleavage furrow forms just where it's supposed to, pulls the purse string, mother and daughter cell are formed. Now it turns out that We've learned about how furrostatin works. How we did that is a subject for lecture number four, the final lecture. Furrostatin interacts with a key protein that is part of this cleavage furrow. It's not the actin polymer itself, but it's a protein that communicates with the actin protein, a protein called non-muscle myosin 2. We roll this one. This is an illustration of 
the myosin protein shown here, which is a motor. It gives the cell the mechanical force, and it's actually motoring along across the actin fiber itself of the cleavage furrow. When furrostatin is added, it binds to the non-muscle myosin 2 protein, inhibits, in this case, inactivates the function, and freezes the mechanical actions of the cleavage furrow. Now, the ability to take dynamic life processes, in this particular case, the cleavage furrow, but many others, and freeze it temporarily, is very valuable as an experimental tool. In this particular case, the cell has been stained with two different uh, pairs of reagents. It's the same cell, seen an image of it, and <clears throat> we're going to use these stains to interrogate where various proteins and macromolecules in the cell are at the stage of stalled cleavage furrow right at the beginning. You can see that here, these cells, the cell treated with furrostatin, uh, had the chromosomes segregating to opposite poles. There's the microtubules that were tugging them apart. First, we're going to stain for the target of furrostatin, myosin 2. Well, happily, that protein is right where the cleavage furrow should be. So that's, that's interesting and satisfying that it's targeting a protein that's right where the cleavage furrow is. But this technique allows you to look at other proteins that are less well-defined in terms of their function. One example is the protein anilin. If we looked at anilin in various stages of the cell, it would be distributed throughout the cell. When the cell is frozen with furrostatin, we stain for anilin, you see that anilin protein is right where the cleavage furrow is forming. It's right where myosin is. Now, this doesn't prove anything. This is not a case of guilt by association. But it's provocative, and it generates a hypothesis. The hypothesis being that maybe anilin is somehow part of this process as well. Now, it turns out the story is even nicer than this. Chemical genetics is through the use of different disciplines and integrating different disciplines of chemistry and biology and engineering and computer science is yielding more and more of these probes, these small molecules like furrostatin. For example, I raised the question, how did the, how did the cleavage furrow know where to go and when to form? Well, probably there's got to be some regulatory mechanism. There's going to be some signaling molecules talking to myosin and anilin. There are some candidate signaling molecules already for which we have small molecule probes. We can manipulate their function and ask, does myosin go to the right place? Does anilin go to the right place? If it perturbs one of their localizations but not the other, it tells you that the signaling is distinct for the two. If it affects both of them, it might suggest that they're on the same regulatory circuit. I'm going to leave you with the analogy here, before I take some questions from the audience, of high-speed photography. I want to leave you with the impression that the life processes encoded within the human genome that we heard about are very dynamic, and therefore makes them difficult to study. But having these kinds of tools now, with increasing frequency, that can freeze them out and allow them to progress is like looking at individual snapshots. If I were to show you a film, of a bullet piercing the queen of hearts, you probably could tell very little about that process. You probably, if you didn't listen to it, couldn't even tell from the direction from which the bullet was derived. But with high-speed photography, we can see all the details of the rotating bullet. We can see the cleavage furrow and the queen of hearts. So with that analogy, I'm going to stop here and see if I can get some questions from the audience. Yes? Does the furrow status actually inhibit the cleavage furrow ever taking place, or does it only stall it? Like, could it eventually the, take place? The, it all depends on when you add the, the furrow statin. The, the, the cleavage furrow looks like it's actually forming in the presence of furrow statin. It's just not functioning. And I think the reason for that is that the functioning of the furrow that yields that dynamic process involves the mechanical motor-like actions of the myosin protein. It has to ratchet along the actin and drag its cargo with it, and somehow that's leading to a constriction of the cell. So the furrow forms in the presence of furrostatin, but it doesn't function. If 
We add it a little later, and the furrow forms, begins to function, and we stop it right in the middle of it. So it doesn't complete division? It doesn't complete division as long as the furrow statin is present. Wash it away, cells proceed through division. Yes? Um, with these small molecules, uh, you, what you've shown here is mainly used for determining the, 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 the properties of uh, proteins and what they do, their functions. Yes. Is it also used at all to, um, to treat any, any diseases? Very good question. What I'm focusing on here is the use of small molecules to perturb biological systems and biological processes. Perturbing them is a first step towards using them as therapeutic agents. It turns out it's a lot easier to make small molecules that serve as these probes than to take them to the next step and make them safe therapeutic agents. But it is the first step. So it's another dividend of probing biology this route by looking at the proteins and small molecules that interfere with them rather than through the genes themselves because you at least do have a starting point on um, intervening in a therapeutic manner. Now, I'm not sure that non-vessel myosin 2 is going to be a very good therapeutic target because probably many cells will require the same protein in that cleavage furrow process and during cell division. What would be very exciting is to find components of this cleavage furrow or other steps of the cell division, for example, that we find cancer cells have a particular dependence on. So this again requires the, the, the uh, dissecting of the functions of these proteins in healthy and in disease states. Yes? I was wondering, how do you determine, I mean, how do you figure out what small molecules to use? Mm. Do you use a program where do you just Mm. If, or do you just figure out how they bond and just do like a guess and check method? Another terrific question. Or, yeah. Yep. Um, you know, the, the, the field has evolved over the past several decades. There have been various times, um, I'll take you way back, decades ago. The answer is you searched randomly and, 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 and hoped that you had uh, the good luck that, that Eric referred to. Okay. Then there was a period of time where we thought we were, in fact, a little smarter than we really were. We thought, ah, we have so much new information, structures of proteins. We understand how these molecules, the, the shapes that they adopt by looking at their models, we'll start just designing them, getting them to fit together properly. There's been some success in that, but the truth is it's mostly been a success at the stage of fine-tuning the molecules getting them the slight alterations that just tweak the specificity a little bit more. What's happened, in fact, and this again, is, these are such great questions, you keep taking us to the future topics. Um, what's happened is I would say we've gone back to the future. We've gone back to the old idea that we should allow an element of chance in the whole process. It's just that we've gotten really good to the same process that you heard about in the first lecture of increasing the throughput of experimentation. By high throughput means, we can now perturb much more broadly with many different possible solutions, and we can observe the consequences much more precisely and pick the winner, so find the, the needle in the haystack. So it's back to the future. It's a lot of chance involved, but we're just getting so good at the process that we can pick out the winner with very high frequency. And I'm, before I get too far behind here, we have a, uh, we don't call this the holiday lectures for anything. This is, a, this is a, the gift that goes along with the holiday. And one good question here. We had one good question over here. And thank you very much. Uh, let's see, in the back. Yes, can you redefine what small molecules is? Ah, uh, redefine what the small molecules, that's, you're, you're, you, this is the toughest question, because I didn't really, you know, I, I said I was going to try, and I said I was going to have a hard time, because small molecules are smaller than macromolecules, okay? Um, they, they are formed by bonding of, Generally speaking, G 
generally speaking, four or five atoms, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, nitrogen are the standard ones, but then more rarely phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, bromine. The bonding themselves follows the basic rules of chemical bonding. Chlorine forms two bonds, carbon forms four. Now, beyond that, if you consider the number of permutations that are conceivable for small molecules to satisfy those requirements, it's literally um, you know, 10 to the 60 of molecules having less than 500 molecular weight or more molecules than exist atomic particles in the universe. So um, they are very difficult to define, as you can, as you can hear. They, you, you know what? The best thing I can say is that if you, the more you see them, the more you recognize them. You start to put them into a bucket and say, that looks like a small molecule. Okay, I think that's our last question. Thanks for one more great question. Good catch. And one I'm missing over here. Okay, let's go on with the second part now of my presentation. I want to come back to some basic questions. Where do these small molecules come from? And the answer is two basic sources, one from nature, one from the laboratory. Molecules from nature we call natural products. You are familiar with these, actually. They're all around you. The color in the leaves, the change throughout the season, those are natural products. The sweet taste of a fresh orange, that's a natural product. The natural product that I'm going to be showcasing here, named rapamycin, is typical of many natural products. It actually comes from the soil. It comes from a microorganism. This particular microorganism was discovered on Easter Island, some of you may recognize, the icon. Um, literally from a sample of soil, microbiologists cultured organisms within that soil sample, microorganisms, bacteria in this case, a streptomyces strain, and then search for small molecule natural products made by the microorganism that may have some valuable property. The small molecule that resulted, I showed you earlier, rapamycin, has had very valuable properties, not only as a biological probe, as I'm going to be focused on even greater detail in my final lecture, but as a medicine. Rapamycin turns out to be now a life-saving medicine, one of the most recently uh, approved clinical drugs. In this case, it's thus far been used in organ transplantation. Rapamycin has the ability to tame the immune system down so that a patient receiving a foreign heart during heart transplantation no longer will attack that foreign heart through its immune system in the presence of rapamycin. Rapamycin is also being shown more recently to have very promising, exciting properties as an anti-cancer agent. Again, some of this I hope will become a little more clear at the end of my lecture tomorrow. I want to focus, however, on small molecules from laboratory synthesis, because there's some really major advances in laboratory synthesis that are allowing greater access to a more a broader range of small molecule structures. Now, small molecule synthesis in the laboratory come about first from target-oriented synthesis. This is a, a venerable field that's been around for 60, 70, 80 years now. Um, and as its name implies, it's a kind of synthesis that targets a particular small molecule. I'm going to be focusing mostly on a new type of synthesis called diversity-oriented synthesis. And as its name implies, it aims to synthesize highly diverse small molecule structures. Target-oriented synthesis comes about from our understanding today of hundreds, if not thousands, of chemical reactions, chemical transformations. Now, that may sound daunting to you to think about studying chemistry. You have to learn about all these reactions. But the good news is, these reactions follow some very simple, basic principles. And once you learn those principles, you don't actually have to know all the reactions. The reactions become much more uh, reasonable and um, uh, easy even to predict. Now, synthesis requires learning how to juggle those reactions, usually in a linear sequence, many steps in a row, to take very simple compounds into very complex ones. 
And the example that I'm going to show you here is again my favorite natural product, rapamycin. Um, my lab, 14 years ago, when we started our studies with rapamycin, decided that we needed to synthesize it. We thought an alternative source, not just from the soil from Easter Island, might be the laboratory. We succeeded in that synthesis. It took us about five years, it took about um, five student trainees during that period of time to work their way through what turned out to be about 50 consecutive reactions. When we were done, we had one very precious new compound, a small molecule, rapamycin, but only one. And it was a long and arduous uh, task to get there. I'm going to contrast that with what I'll be discussing with you today. I'm going to give you a little tutorial today about this new kind of synthesis, very exciting kind of synthesis, DOS, or diversity-oriented synthesis. We again start with a simple compound. But now what we do is we run a very limited number of steps. Two reactions is what I'm going to show you, sometimes three or four, but usually no more. Two or three types of reactions. The big difference is we're going to take our simple compound and run that one reaction but many slight variations of it to radiate outward like a starburst with different building blocks being used in this reaction. If we follow one product we'll take that one and pick a second reaction and we'll starburst out not in a linear fashion now but expand outwards with many subtle variations in the building blocks that we'll use with that single reaction. And maybe then we'll even do it a third time. So I'll give you a specific example that was just recently uh, completed about a year ago in my lab. This is an example of a simple small molecule. We selected it for some subtle features that it contains within it. There's a functionality off here that you'll see is really quite important in terms of the two reactions we're going to subject this compound to. Now, if I were performing a target-oriented synthesis, I would take my compound, I'd put it in a big flask, like you may see over there on the shelf, and I'd take all that compound through the first chemical transformation. In diversity-oriented synthesis, we take that single compound, and we split it. The shown here is about 25 different flasks. In reality, in this case, we took a little bit over 40 different flasks. Okay? Now, boy, it's starting to sound more complicated, but in fact, this process is not that complicated. A couple of tricks we do in this process. The small molecule itself is actually not alone. It's attached to a little polymeric plastic bead. I don't know if you're going to be able to see this here up on the screen. So these little plastic beads are about the size of a fish egg, if you've ever had caviar. And we attach the simple small molecule to these beads. That's the first step. The second step is we pour equal amounts of those beads into our reaction flask. It's now not a flask, it's a little tube. And we're going to use over 40 of these tubes but in fact, we're only subjecting them to one type of reaction. It's the same reaction. So we build a little contraption like this, which my students in the lab refer to as the cow, for reasons that may be apparent to you. So there's 40 different little tubes that have been attached, and we can filter them, and we can um, uh, aspirate through a connection over here, but we can manipulate all 40 in one single operation. Okay, let's take a look now at just one of those tubes. We're going to focus on just one and see what's going to happen to it. This is the tube, this is the small molecule. We've learned about these reactions and, and rules of chemical bonding, and we know that this orange compound is a partner for the blue compound. We know that there's functionality within this orange compound that will join together with functionality within the blue compound in the fashion that's shown. This is an example of a chemical transformation, one of those thousands. It has a particular name. It's called the Diels-Alder reaction. Um, the name's not important, but it's a, it turns out to be a very useful general kind of reaction process. So that yields the blue-orange compound. Now, the next step is we take each 
each one of these now, which has a slight variation of the blue-orange compound, and we take it and we split it into 40 new flats. We take 1 40th of each one of these, reattach them to our cow, and I'm going to just focus on the outcome of one of these. Let's look at just one to typify this, this process. There's our blue-orange compound. We look at this compound, once again, we see functionality within it that's chemically compatible with, now, the red compound, the red building block. So we mix together the red compound, the blue-orange compound, and the outcome is yet another small molecule. This we'll call the orange-blue-red compound, the checkerboard symbolizing this one is shown. Okay, so let's review what we've done. We took the simple building block, we split it into 40 some odd different flats. We focused just on one of them and we saw that by using just two chemical reactions, we could generate the blue-orange compound and the blue-orange-red compound. But remember, for each one of the original 40, we're generating variations of those compounds with different building blocks. Now let's just focus on the blue-orange compounds. In principle, we could look within those structures and find more chemical functionality that would allow us to run the third reaction. We've got that on the books, but we haven't done it yet. So let's just focus on what's been accomplished. Let's look at these three compounds, remind you of their structures. And now, conceptually, I'm going to ask you to think about what we've done just to make these three in the, in the form of a matrix. You'll see why in a moment. Now, we start with a sort of trivial one by one by one matrix that yields three new compounds. Now I'm going to take you to what happens when we go to a two by two by two matrix, and then we're going to expand it all the way as we actually did in the synthesis. Can we roll the next animation, please? So here's our blue compound, and the white one is now a cousin. Here's our orange compound, and the white variation is a cousin of the orange. There's our two by two matrix. We've already seen what happens when you mix the blue and the orange, you get the blue-orange compound. But now we're going to get the white-orange combination and the blue-white combination, and of course the white and white combination. That's just a two by two matrix. Now we're going to consider a two by two by two matrix. Remember we have the second reaction, the red building block. We've already seen that the red compound joins together with the blue-orange to generate the, the blue-orange-red compound. But of course, now the other combinations will occur. The red's going to join with the other compounds, generating four new compounds. We've got a total of eight, and we're going to complete this with a cousin of the red to make a two-by-two-by-two by two by two matrix for more compounds. That's now 12. <clears throat> but now simply imagine <clears throat> what happens when you did this <clears throat> in the actual 40 by 40 by 40 plus or minus some matrix, we generate 88,400 new compounds. Now, once again, you might be daunted by this information. You might even be a little depressed about thinking about doing this kind of synthesis. I told you that five students struggled for five years to make rapamycin. <clears throat> What's going on with 88,400 new compounds? Well. One of the real messages I think Eric and I have to bring to you today is that modern science involves interdisciplinary research, bringing different disciplines together. Synthesis alone would be still equally laborious, but there's all kinds of techniques, from computer science and engineering especially, that render this process rather simple. What do I mean by that? Well, the actual synthesis of these 88,400 compounds now is performed by one, one person in the lab. This is Ouyang Kuan. Ouyang studied at Columbia, learning about target-oriented synthesis, and she came to my lab a couple years ago to learn about diversity-oriented synthesis. She spent about a year or so developing the basic chemistry that I've outlined for you, and it took her about four months to actually execute that synthesis of 88,400 compounds. And now Ouyang is a, is a professor at UCLA teaching her own students in Los Angeles. Um, how to do diversity-oriented synthesis. Now, <clears throat> one last introductory concept before we break for the next set of questions. 
All I've done thus far is given you a sense of using diversity and synthesis, how we can make these small molecules. I haven't told you how we can discover the ferrostatins among them or the ferrostatin um, orthologs that might target the other myosin family members. I want to leave you with a conceptual view of how we do that before then, in, again, in my last lecture, I'll take you through two specific examples in the context of the disease diabetes, teach you about how we're learning about diabetes using this, these techniques of how, conceptually at least, we find the winning small molecule, the needle in the haystack. And the way I want you to envision this is that we develop a technique that allows those 88,400 compounds to flow as a stream. And we have a sensor that, that filters through each and every small molecule, searching for a desirable process. Can we roll the final animation, please? So imagine these are O. Young's 88,400 compounds flying by in the stream. Now, what is the filter? What, how, do we, how do we screen for these small molecules? The filter is going to be a protein. A protein of interest, for example, here's that calmodulin protein. The vast majority of small molecules do not have the proper shape to be a magnet to the calmodulin protein, but the rare needle in the haystack does, and if you configure the experiment properly, you can pluck that small molecule out of the stream and find your winning probe molecule. Finally, the last point before I take some questions, um, the, uh, it turns out that's a good way to think about it conceptually, but there's two very important, different, distinct ways of doing this process. One of them says, I think the myosin proteins, or the calmodulin proteins, or the uh, orthologs of the myosin proteins are really important, and I'm going to screen my small molecules against them. <clears throat> In that case, you take a pure protein and screen your small molecules. There's a problem with this approach, however, it doesn't allow you to discover the chance, unusual, unexpected finding. And to do that, you need to screen the proteins while they're functioning in cells or in organisms. So I'm going to introduce to you tomorrow the process of cellular and organismal screening as well. We're going to screen those small molecules while the cell, while the protein is actually functioning inside of the cell. <clears throat> and with that, I think I'll, I'll stop and take a few questions. Question in the back. I was wondering, when you try to make a certain small molecule, do you ever end up like accidentally making other ones that are useful to you, or do you just screen out all those other ones? Uh, that's that's a great question again. Um, we like we work so hard to develop the chemistry so that it's so precise that. Every theoretical compound that's made in that big 40 by 40 by 40 matrix is made, and precisely only those compounds are made. And we're getting pretty good at it, pretty good at it. Maybe we have, you know, at each step, 95% success. But multiply 95% success by 95% success several times, and you start getting the unexpected surprises in there. They do exist. And we have had some experience with them. They've emerged um, unexpected structures that weren't supposed to be there, but they were actually the winners. So the downside of that is that it takes a little bit more time to do some detective work to figure out what the precise structure is as opposed to what it was supposed to be. I guess the upside is that you've, generate, you've, you've created a little more chance, and this whole process is about taking advantage of chance observations. Question. I was wondering, uh, you said that in the beginning that target-oriented synthesis was often very long and laborious and going and just took a lot of effort on your half to do this. What got sifting through all these, you know, you said was 88,400, yeah. would, would that be almost equally laborious to uh, so sort through them? Mm -hmm. as a, so so I, I've given you a sense that we can now make them, mm -hmm. but now what do you do with them? You got a big problem on hand. And once again, this, 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 the reason we're able to sort through them is that chemistry connects with neighboring disciplines. And the tricks we learn from genomics, 
and the tricks we learn from biology and from engineering and computer science, as some of the main ones, have made extraordinarily powerful and effective ways to screen through all 88,000 in a very short period of time and with real precision. So there are some techniques now that are pretty widely available that would allow you to look at those 88,000 in maybe an hour and with a single student with, uh, in fact, six different microscope slides, as I'll try to show you tomorrow in tomorrow's lecture. Okay, here I get a very good question here, and I think I owe someone in the back, all right? <laughs> if I don't, there you go. Good catch. Uh, let's see, question in the back, and you're, you're next. I was wondering um, where you got the idea of using chemistry and biology. To, to are using small molecules um, to find out things about biological processes. Ah, that's great. You know, I um, that's a I can give you my personal answer here. I I um, I didn't do it in any calculated way. I did it um, by a process of sort of waking up in the morning and just asking my you know what, what's the most fascinating thing out there. And I think I first fell in love with these shapes. I didn't know anything about chemistry when I went to college. I had no clue what chemistry was about. And I attended a lecture um, only at my sister's urging three weeks into college. And to be perfectly honest, I was just about ready to quit college because um, I didn't find it to my liking. But I sat in on this lecture, and the professor drew up molecules of this sort. And I thought, that's unbelievable. I have no idea what the professor's drawing, but it's beautiful. I thought it was an art class. So I fell in love with chemistry thinking I was taking art. And I learned about the rules of chemistry and uh, will carry that passion with me to, to my grave. But you know, a number of years later, <clears throat> I started to realize what these molecules do. And I realized that they, they actually have a function out there in life, in, in nature. <clears throat> they interact with proteins and they they modulate function and so forth. And that started life processes and life started to become just an amazingly interesting and fascinating challenge and, and exciting problem. So I thought I would start to study that problem. And I thought I was pretty smart. I thought, ah, I figured out uh, a very special way of studying biology with these small molecules. Perturb them, see what happens. And then I uh, I was a century behind the scientists that Eric mentioned on January of uh, 1900. I discovered a hundred years later that my idea was a very old one. It's called genetics. But I was okay. I thought, you know, this is a slight variation of, of genetics, and this was my portal into biology. And that certainly deserves, I think we've got two more. Okay. Catch. And let's see, I think I. Promise here in the middle, please. Uh, you had mentioned the rapamycin, and you said that um, it was used for organ transplants yes. and it tames the immune system. Yes. But wouldn't that increase the chance of other illnesses with the death? Right. You are incredible. That's exactly correct. The most <clears throat> paradoxically, as I said, it, it's treated. It's actually being used for cancer. Um, what happens is that patients that are on extended treatment with rapamycin will have a tendency to develop the earliest signs of cancer. Presumably, it's been argued, because the immune system's been tamed, and presumably because the immune system is constantly surveying the earliest signs of cancer. Now, because there's some evidence of this. Clinicians know of this, and they know how to regiment the use of the drug. So they guard against this happening. However, there was a totally unexpected finding with rapamycin that, again, I'm going to discuss in my next lecture, because suppressing the immune system was not to have anything to do with diabetes. But that's a new and unexpected byproduct of inappropriate use of rapamycin. Now, the good news is, again, through dosing, and the fact that these drugs like furostatin are reversible, you can take a patient off rapamycin for a period of time, 
give them another drug and let that deleterious side effect go away because it's reversible and then put them back. But this unexpected connection was one of the wonderful outcomes in the sense of this because it made a connection between fundamental processes of the immune system and fundamental processes leading to diabetes, which I think is going to shine a new light on the, the process of acquiring type 2 diabetes. I think I just got a sign. We got one more time for one more question. Um, with the small molecules that you create, then you said you use a protein to filter them out. Is it possible that one, two molecules or more could fit into the same protein? And then if that happened, how would you differentiate between which small molecule did what you want it to do and which ones don't? And how would you separate that one from the rest of them? That's a great question. In fact, it happens. It's rare. Because the single binding event itself is pretty rare, but the double binding event then might be, say, doubly rare, but not so rare that it doesn't actually happen. So you got to be on the lookout for it, number one. And if you are on the lookout for it and you detect it, there's good news. If you find two molecules that bind to the same protein, you can, using chemistry, stitch them together and, and convert them into one, and you get a super strong binder with very, very high selectivity. So you actually, it's rare, but you look for it because you hope it'll happen because you can turn it to your advantage. So that's all the time we have for the questions. I have one, one uh, my favorite uh, t-shirt left here, and I think I owe someone in the audience uh, another one. We'll get that for you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Stuart, for literally bringing chemistry to life for us. And thank you, students in the audience, for your great questions. This would be a good time to visit the Holiday Lectures website. And please join us again tomorrow morning, where we, were, we are going to continue this fascinating journey through genomes and how to perturb genomes, as well as how to observe genomes. We'll see you again then. series. In my previous lecture, I outlined for you some of the key tools of chemical genetics, especially diversity-oriented synthesis and small molecule screening that allow us to explore biology, the life sciences, and perhaps even medicine. These tools are especially useful, as I tried to indicate yesterday, in exploring the very dynamic processes um, in life. On this slide, I've outlined just a few of the kinds of problems now that are being uh, interrogated by use of chemical genetics. And these include molecular events, like gene regulation, cellular events, such as programmed cell death, organismal events, such as the development of a heart in zebrafish, and even those relevant to medicine, such as cancer. In my lecture today, I'm going to focus on this problem, the problem of glucose and other nutrient sensing by cells, tissues, and organisms, like yourself, humans. And I'm going to talk about how, when this process goes awry, the outcome can be type 2 diabetes. Now we heard 
yesterday and today about genomics and the importance of genomics. Genomics has taught us many things. Genomics is, uh, teaches us to think broadly about a problem, to think, in fact, system-wide about problems, to take a global approach. We're now able, for the first time, to look at all of the DNA, all of the genes that we heard about, all of the messenger RNAs, and even variations in the DNA sequences and variations in the levels of the messenger RNA. I'm going to use the glucose response and type 2 diabetes to illustrate that the underlying principles I discussed yesterday of genetics, but also of genomics, are relevant to the way in which we use small molecules to uh, explore biology. And I'm going to, again, do so in the process of looking at glucose response, either one gene or one protein at a time, but also in this system-wide approach by looking at all of the relevant genes or proteins at once. Now, the fact that proteins tend to work in networks as opposed to in isolation is probably most clearly illustrated in life's regulatory processes. These are the, these are the mechanisms that life used to provide the appropriate output given a certain level of input. <clears throat> I'm going to uh, show you how these interacting proteins function as networks, as I said, Network's a term that I don't know how familiar you are with. The biologists, the biology community is only now beginning to think more and more about concepts from, of networks from other areas of science, a continuing theme in these lectures. We learn about networks that, for example, when proteins talk to each other, they do so with loops, feedback loops. They can be positive and they can be negative. And that when networks are established, Redundant pathways are often used. These loops and these redundant pathways yield robust networks, networks that are able to adapt to changes in environmental cues and, very importantly, are able to respond with switch-like or all-or-nothing behavior to very tiny changes in environmental cues. So, for example, when your body is detecting 5 millimolar glucose in its bloodstream, and suddenly there's a change to 2.5 millimolar glucose, well, that's only a two-fold change, but the effect on the physiology, for example, the brain is, is, is tremendous. And so we need not to just have a two-fold change in brain physiology. We need a switch-like, all-or-nothing major change in response to that small change in concentration. I'm going to be talking about two interacting networks. We call them signaling networks. The first involves the blood that reaches different cells and, and organs in the body and brings with it the nutrients, especially glucose. Now we've learned a little bit about how cells respond to varying levels of glucose. And we've learned about a number of interacting proteins that comprise this nutrient response signaling network. I've given you four such proteins that we have a pretty good handle on right now. Nutrients talk to protein one, and then protein two, and then protein three, and then finally protein four. Actually, we know the names of these proteins. I'm not going to give them to you because they're not necessary for this particular discussion, with the exception of one. I've labeled protein two as the FRAP protein because some of you may recall, I introduced the FRAP protein as the protein that FKBP12, when bound to rapamycin, is bound to. It is the target of FKBP rapamycin. Now, there's a second signaling network here. We call it the insulin response signaling network. Here, insulin is a signaling protein outside of the cell. It binds to the sensing component of this network, the insulin receptor. It, pa it passes its signal through these intermediary proteins, the mediators of the signal, proteins 5, 6, 7, 8, and then to protein 4. 
Now, there's a number of puzzling things about this network, these two networks. For example, the arrows indicate an activating event. When protein 5 talks to protein 6, it activates it. These T bars represent an inhibitory event. When protein 1 talks to protein 2, it inhibits it. Thus far, what we've seen is that all of the proteins on the first network inhibit each other, a cascade of inhibitory events. We've seen in the second signaling network that all of the proteins activate each other. Now, we don't know whether there's something important here, whether this is teaching us something or not, and the reason we don't is that these are certainly not all of the components of this network. This is a common case in, in current studies of signaling networks. We've got pieces of the puzzle, but we don't have the whole picture together. And maybe when we find other components, this simple rule that seems to exist will be broken. Now, there's another really important issue in this little picture here that I'd like to focus on. Protein 4. I call it a node. One of the things we've learned is that networks talk to networks. And they do so through common proteins, proteins part, that are part of each of the two networks. So I'm calling that kind of protein a node. And again, we know the identity of this nodal protein. So this signaling network, beginning with glucose, sends a, a set of inhibitory signals. Ultimately, if protein 3 were active, inhibiting protein 4. And this network sends us a, a set of activating signals ultimately through protein 8, which if protein 8 were active, would then activate protein 4. So there's crosstalk between signaling networks, and um, they, this crosstalk occurs through these nodal proteins. Now why should we be interested in these two particular signaling networks? Well, one very interesting element of these networks is that if something goes awry in either of the two, or in fact in both of the two, type 2 diabetes results. So the correlation we've seen about this still very mysterious disease, a disease for which we do not know the molecular origins, we know that humans that have acquired type 2 diabetes have problems, mistakes, in both of these signaling networks. Second reason that we become interested in this is that we have a useful new tool to begin to pick apart the mistakes that occur in these networks and to learn more about the signaling networks. And that's this small molecule that I introduced to you yesterday named rapamycin. Rapamycin, when bound to FKBP12, binds to FRAP. Remember, the composite surface of FKBP rapamycin is complementary to the FRAP binding surface. That was an example of a small molecule activating the FRAP protein, to, I mean the FKBP protein, to be able to bind to FRAP. Now when that binding occurs, FRAP's activity is inhibited. So if you inhibit the FRAP protein, what that does is it releases the brakes on the protein to which it regulates, protein 3. It releases the brakes. It allows protein 3 to do what it normally does, and what it normally does is to inhibit protein 4. Now with this little diagram, we can begin to understand why rapamycin causes cells, tissues, organs, and even humans to be tricked into thinking that in that there are very low levels of glucose and very low levels of insulin, even when the cell, for example, is swimming in glucose and swimming in insulin. Because insulin would normally activate protein 4. FRAP unleashes this inhibitory protein, which inhibits protein 4, sending this confusing message that there must be low levels of insulin, there must be low levels of glucose. Now what's even more important, as I mentioned to you yesterday, despite the fact that rapamycin is a very powerful, very useful, clinically used drug that saves lives in patients with having organ transplants, it has some side effects. And one of the side effects is that it's been found quite unexpectedly recently to induce type 2 diabetes in patients that are taking it. 
Now that may sound very worrisome, and of course it is a concern, but as I mentioned yesterday, we can dose the rapamycin, and these small molecule effects are reversible. So patients can be taken off of rapamycin and put onto a different immunosuppressant temporarily. But this observation has been a shining a powerful new light on this mysterious process, and that's what I'd like to discuss with you. Now, we have eight different proteins in this network that I've mentioned to you already. We have one small molecule probe of one of those proteins. First thing I'd like to illustrate is a technique that's now being used to generate probes to those other proteins, those other signaling proteins. We saw in the previous lecture, a beautiful illustration of the miniaturization of arrays, and you saw your, your DNA chips, tiny glass microscope slides that have little spots of DNA. Well, scientists today can make spots of small molecules as well as DNA. So the very similar high degree of miniaturization increases the throughput in this analysis. These are called small molecule microarrays. And if you remember, I gave you an example yesterday of the synthesis of 88,400 small molecules. In fact, all 88,000 can be arrayed onto about six microscope slides. So what I'm going to show you is um, an example of a machine that's used to synthesize, to, to array 12,000 small molecules on 100 different microscope chips. So giving you vast numbers of small molecules. And I'm going to show you how we use these arrays to identify new probes of those other signaling proteins. So here what we're going to do is take the protein of interest, proteins 1 through 8, and wash them over these microscope slides. We're going to do so in a way that the protein is labeled with a fluorophore. So if one of these small molecules is a match, a geometric complementary match, and can recruit the protein then to its spot, we'll see it in the form of light. Can we roll the first movie, please? So this is a micro arraying robot. You know, it's actually not unlike the robot that's used to print the New York Times. What we have are 48 quill pens that you see here. And they're spotting one nanoliter solutions of these small molecules. That was making 100 microscope slides. I've honed in on just eight of them now. We need eight to, to, to run this experiment. This is an example then of the microarray with 12,000 different spots per microarray. We wash the protein over these arrays with the label. And if we get lucky, and one of those is the complementary shape, then we have, voila, a new small molecule probe of one of those proteins. So this is one of the ways, conceptually at least, in which we're finding small molecules to modulate functions, perturbing functions, so that we can then observe the consequences. Now I told you that we didn't have all of the components of the network put together yet. But I've got this new technique that's able to give me new probes of the ones we, we, we do have. So, are we going to be able to use this technique alone to completely dissect this network? Does someone out there see a, a, a flaw in the technique thus far? Yes? Sometimes the pathways behave differently in cells than in the autosome. Ah, very good. Sometimes the path, that's exactly right. This is an in vitro experiment. We are just using small molecules with purified proteins in this experiment. Proteins really function inside of cells. And we've got to make sure that our compounds themselves can function and modulate the function of these target proteins inside of cells. Actually, there's another reason as well. There may be other components that we haven't figured out that the small molecule can modulate that we could detect if we turned our screening system into a cell-based one. And that's what I'm going to show you here. When you screen for proteins in their natural cellular setting, you have a new challenge, a lot of technical challenges. First of all, you can't wash the proteins in, the, in, in their cellular context over these microarrays because proteins don't wash very well. They like to stick to glass. So first way we solve that problem is we reverse the order. We actually put the proteins in the cells down 
And then to those, we will add individual small molecules. Now, if you think about the nature of small molecules and cells, it turns out that microscope slides are not as useful anymore. But this simple device, this simple so-called 384 well plate, which has deep wells within it, are subject now, they're, they're in a standardized form, and we have robots that can take a stack of them and or lay them out in, in an appropriate order. We have robots that can deliver cells into each individual well very rapidly. We have robots that can deliver stock solutions of small molecules and other reagents that might be useful in this experiment. So this has become a workhorse uh, in this kind of experiment, and I'm going to show you in a second how we do this uh, in the context of this network problem that I've outlined. Next problem is how do we focus in on the network? So what we're going to do here is focus in on the diabetic network, I'll call it, the composite of those two, by, well, we can't find diabetic cells because diabetes is a disease of a, of a whole organism. But we can do something that's a pretty good approximation. I just told you rapamycin affects this pathway. I actually forgot to mention that not only does rapamycin affect this pathway, but it actually induces this disease. So let's take the rapamycin molecule and treat cells with it, and then consider that a diabetic-like cell. And now we're going to screen for small molecules that can reverse this effect, that can convert the diabetic cell into the healthy cell. Can we roll this animation, please? So here's our 384 well plate. So we're going to zoom in on it now. We've already robotically delivered cells, as you can see, into the individual wells. And another robot is delivering pure samples of different small molecules. Here you see rapamycin-treated cells. Now, we have techniques from optical physics today, for example, that can detect optically whether a cell is in a diabetic light state, whether it's been treated with rapamycin or not. And likewise, we have techniques that distinguish those from the healthy cells. So when we ran this experiment, we, we searched for many, many, many small molecules. Remember I told you we synthesized thousands of them, 88,000 in one particular case, and it was only one rare one. This one we call SMUR, or small molecule inhibitor of rapamycin that was able to reverse that diabetic-like state of rapamycin and convert those cells to healthy cells. Now, we don't know how this happens. We don't understand yet how it happens. But SMUR is now a new probe. We don't know the protein to which SMUR binds, but Whatever it's binding to must be part of this network and must be, it must be a really interesting part if it's able to flip the switch back to the healthy state. How we find the target of SMUR and furostatin that I mentioned yesterday will be the subject of the, the next part of my lecture, but at this point I'd like to stop and take some questions. Question in the back. Uh, right there. Um, do you know if the SMUR is affecting directly rapamycin, or if it's directing one of the proteins in the pathway, and how do you, I guess you're getting to that. So, you know that that's a great question, because one thing it could be doing, which would be a little less interesting, we the molecules directly affecting the rapamycin molecules. So, when you don't know the target, one of the things you can do is start making guesses, and that's a really good first guess, and that's the, the one guess that we did make, because we wanted to make sure that it wasn't something as simple as that. So we did about every experiment we could imagine to show that, in fact, it was not affecting directly rapamycin, nor the FKBP protein, or FRAP proteins to which rapamycin binds. So it's somewhere else out there. And actually, when I follow up in my final segment here, I'll try to show you how we're using computers to get at this question. Um, now, yesterday we had so many good questions that I actually ran out of t-shirts. And uh, we have some Hughes Institutes, these aren't Harvard, uh, Hughes Institute t-shirts, not some Harvard t-shirts. So I'm going to provide you with one of those. I'm going to double up my gifts, and these are my little 
reminders for those of you asking good questions out here. This is like a, the, 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 the holiday lectures moon rock sample for you. <laughs> We're going to disassemble this little small molecule. This is your little token for remembering the uh, holiday lectures. Okay, let's see. Let's go all the way around. work over on this side. I'm on the very corner back there. Has this smear molecule been found to um, counteract the immunosuppressing effect of rapamycin as well? Very good question again. We haven't checked it, but my feeling is that the immunosuppressing effect of rapamycin is intimately linked with its diabetes-inducing one. And the reason I think that is that the, this signaling network happens to be extremely active in immune cells, lymphocytes, and that very tiny perturbations in it render the immune cells inactive. And I think that's why rapamycin is clinically so useful as an immunosuppressive agent. It's distributing throughout the body, but it's hitting cells and this pathway that are hypersensitive to it. So that's the first thing you see. So, um, but we need to do the experiments and confirm that, that hypothesis. So here's a, here's a t-shirt for you. Oops. And here's a, here's a, a, a piece of furrow satin for you. <laughs> okay, great. Let's see. How about now we'll take one in the middle here. How about, uh, this gentleman right here. I mean, your first method of uh, screening for the small, small um, micromolecules yes. uses a microscope slide. If you um, synthesize these small molecules at different binding patterns, so how are you finding a common adhesive to immobilize the small molecules onto this microscope slide? Boy, this is an amazing question. So, <clears throat> so the question is, that we've got so many different compounds, how do we get them to stick to this microscope slide? Well, that's a really important problem, and so it's a good example of when you develop new technologies like diversity oriented synthesis and small molecule microarrays, you actually need to develop them in parallel as partners. You need to think about this handoff mechanism. So what we do is um, we have three different now, thus far, three different handles we make sure that every one of our 88,400 compounds have at least one of these handles. And then we develop three different complementary surface chemistries. So there's a whole area of chemistry called surface science, where you learn how to do chemistry right on the surface, in this case, of a microscope slide. So we have three different kinds of microscope slides and three different kinds of handles. And thus far, we're able to, to keep track of um, you know, each of the compounds that we make. OK, I have a question over on this side. I understand that a lot of genetic diseases are caused by one inactive protein that doesn't work that affects an entire pathway. Could you then, by understanding, I guess, the, the product of each protein, almost circum circumvent the, uh, the pathway by, by, giving, uh, by giving like a cell like the product? By artificially creating the product and giving the cell the product and thus circumventing the pathway? Oh, okay, very good. In fact, that's exactly what one, in fact, does in many instances. But, but the pathway has an input, and it has these intermediary events, molecules, and it has a, an output. So when we look for a perturbation now, let's say, of the SMR protein, we might add to the cell the input from each of the various steps and see at which point in time we can lose the effect of the SMR. So that's actually a genetic principle. It's called epistasis analysis or ordering of events along a cell. It's a very powerful one in genetics and therefore it turns out to be a very powerful one in chemical genetics. So thank you very much. That was another great question. And uh, let's see, where's the, here's my ferrostatin molecule. I, are you a t-shirt? Are you a piece of ferrostatin? <laughs> and I think I owe another one over here. You get an unusually large chunk of ferrostatin. <laughs> okay, there we go. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to turn now to the final section of the 2002 Holiday Lectures on Science. I'm going to tell you about something I've been alluding to throughout these lectures, and something certainly Eric has mentioned a number of times. 
And that's the importance of information science and computer science on the life sciences today. I'm going to, in particular, tell you about a project that is information science based that we call the ChemBank project. But first, let me remind you of an element of Eric's previous lecture shown on the, on the screen. Eric talked about a matrix of genes and phenotypes and the way in which genes and phenotypes can be linked by studying variation. And the variation in the DNA sequences, for example, are called SNPs, you've heard about. So linking gene 2 to diabetes through a variation is a very powerful way of studying disease processes. This information and related information concerning genes and genomes is available on the World Wide Web through this database called GenBank. This is sort of the incredibly powerful tool that's um, sort of the ultimate uh, creation of the ultimate level playing field within science now because it means anywhere in the world, everyone has all the same access to all the same information as long as you can gain access to a modem and a PC. So, as I work towards the end of my lecture, I'm going to increasingly be talking about things that are in the future. The first project I'm going to tell you about is one that's been, it's called ChemBank, and it's sponsored by the National Cancer Institute. We've been working on this uh, ChemBank project now for a couple of years, and we're hoping that by the summer of 2003, we'll have our first launch on the World Wide Web of ChemBank. So what is ChemBank? ChemBank is conceptually like GenBank. In fact, we select the name as an homage to the venerable GenBank. There's a big difference, though. ChemBank, like GenBank, is a suite of informatics tools. You can access them, and you can analyze data with these tools that can access a set of databases that themselves are linked, so they can talk to each other. But the matrix of ChemBank has instead of genes and phenotypes, proteins and phenotypes. So we're going to look at all the different proteins that one can imagine, and all the different phenotypes that one can imagine, including some of those same phenotypes that were in GenBank, analyzed with SNPs. What is the glue that connects, us, that, that connects the two axes? Well, they are, as Dennis said, not SNPs, but SNPs, small molecule perturbogens. How does this work? Well, let's start with one example that, that, that we discussed yesterday. Remember I told you that Tim Mitchison at Harvard searched for small molecules that perturbed the cleavage furrow process in cell division, because that's a topic of great interest to him. And he found this molecule furrostatin. Well, it turns out, if you go to the proto -chem bank, the precursor of it, not quite ready for prime time, um, it's already sufficiently functioning that if you type in furrostatin and you ask, did any other researcher ever find anything interesting about this same small molecule? One thing you might find is that it may have induced other phenotypes, for example, in an organism. Then you might link cleavage furrow to that process in an organism. But even more illuminating is, as Tim found, when you find Actually, furrostatin was found to bind to a particular protein, like in one of those small molecule microarray experiments. It binds to a particular protein. And the protein found that furrostatin was already known to bind to is non-muscle myosin 2. So just by going to the computer, after seeing, observing this effect, going to the computer, you got a link. A link between myosin 2 and the furrow formation. Now, once again, like I said yesterday, this is not guilt by association. It does not prove that myosin 2 is involved in the cleavage furrow, but it's a very interesting and, and, and reasonable hypothesis. So we look at this chem bank as a kind of hypothesis generating tool. And of course what we want to do is find other small molecules that link other proteins to other phenotypes. So let's do this with SMR. Let's go to the computer. I just told you that SMR this interesting small molecule that came about by the 
phenotypic observational screen, screening for small molecules that reverse the diabetic-like state of a cell, convert it to the healthy state, has a very interesting effect on cells, but we don't know the protein to which it binds, and therefore we can't suggest or hypothesize what protein component might be a part of these signaling networks. Well, in this case, unlike ferrostatin, we find that the database is not sufficiently populated. We don't know the answer yet. We need more data, we need more information to go into ChemBank. Not unlike the timeline that Eric discussed, where the SNPs, hopefully, will be completed in two or three years down the road. But incomplete at this point means you don't always get the answer. But I think the main point that I'm trying to make here is that taking clues again from the genomic principles that we heard about earlier, we get this sense of the importance of global measurements, of doing everything to fill out the matrix, the various matrices that you've seen in the various presentations. Or another way to put it is that genomics teaches us that the outcome of all of the experiments, sometimes more important than the outcome of any individual one, because if you get the outcome of all the experiments, you use a computer and a database and search tools to interrogate it, you might make connections between seemingly disparate experiments that suddenly generate your new hypothesis. So information science is important today to link chemistry, biology, and medicine. And what I've given you is an illustration of ChemBank in its early form, informing by, where ChemBank through chemistry is informing biology. Those ferrostatin molecules coming from, and SMR molecules coming from chemistry are making links between, between biology and teaching us about networks and pathways and regulation. I'm going to finish this presentation with an illustration of how ChemBank, multifaceted as we hope it to be, can allow biology to now inform chemistry. So here's the problem that we're trying to solve through the use of modern information science and computers. Yesterday, I told you about basic outline of diversity-oriented synthesis. And I suggested that diversity-oriented synthesis, DOS, aims to make highly complex and diverse, structurally diverse molecules, molecules having many different shapes, ultimately all the possible shapes necessary to interact with all of the proteins of life. If you think about what I told you, the driving force behind diversity synthesis was really a lot of chemist's knowledge of reactions and chemist's intuition. We didn't actually Think about which compounds should we be making. Of course, we don't really know which compounds we should be making, but we'd at least like to know which set of compounds are maximally different from each other. So we might populate chemical space. This is a concept I'm trying to indicate to you in this cube. Populate chemical space in some dense and random way, complete way. We want to complete the matrix of chemical space. Now, what do I mean by this abstract term, chemical space? Well, just imagine if these three axes represented three computable qualities, characteristics of small molecules. For example, we can certainly calculate the molecular weight of every compound we make, and we don't want to synthesize 88,000 compounds that all have a molecular weight of 522. You know, because what if the magical number is 523? We'd like to get a range from very low molecular weight to very high molecular weight. And consider another axis here is, let's say, solubility. Some compounds are very water-soluble. Some compounds are very lipid-soluble. If we make compounds that are only one or the other, we might miss a whole lot of interesting opportunities to perturb biology. And likewise, this third axis could be the polarity of a small molecule, which you can compute. It's, it's computed dipole moment. Well, we don't want to make molecules that all have exactly the same dipole moment. However, if you think about what I told you about diversity oriented synthesis, we didn't take any of these considerations into mind when we synthesized those 88,000 compounds. So let's retrospectively go back and see how did we do. What I'm plotting for you are three computable properties of small molecules, 
And in blue, in fact, are the 88,400 compounds that I told you about that Oh Young Kwan made. Doesn't look too good, does it? They're pretty clumpy. They're not distributing themselves throughout chemical space the way we'd like to. And I've got in yellow another DOS pathway, in white another diversity organ synthesis pathway, in red. And in each instance, they're pretty clumpy. Ah, they're different clumps, and that's good. But this isn't the way to go about this, I think, in the future. So one element of ChemBank that we're trying to incorporate into the program is application of mathematical algorithms that can tell us in advance which combinations of which building blocks and which combinations of which reactions should we select the minimal set of building blocks and reactions should we select in advance that would then yield compounds that distributed themselves more evenly in chemical space. So what you have here is an illustration of virtual compounds. These actually have not yet been synthesized, but the program is teaching us how to distribute the compounds in this three-dimensional chemical space in a Gaussian distribution. Okay? We can ensure the lack of clumpiness, at least, in this process. Okay, so one thing we hope to do with ChemBank in the future is be able to allow chemists to go to their computer and rather than just running off in the lab and using that blue cow that I showed you yesterday to run all these reactions in parallel, run them in a way where the computer has told us in advance what's the magical combination to distribute these small molecules in chemical space. Now, is that what we really want to do? I think for the time being, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty good goal. We want to be able to occupy all of chemical space with these small molecules. If we don't occupy all of chemical space, how are we ever going to find out what the really important parts of chemical space are as it relates to biological space? Okay, so we want to fill out chemical space so that we can test which areas of chemical space, which region of this three-dimensional plot might be most relevant to different swaths of biology space. What do I mean by that? I mean, is it going to be the case that these compounds that affect diabetes, for example, the subset, the tiny subset of these small molecules that affect diabetes will themselves be distributed in a Gaussian distribution? Or is it possible that there are certain regions of chemical space that are well suited for interacting with that network of proteins in diabetes space. I have a strong sense that there are going to be subsets of chemical space that will serve as the sweet spot for certain swaths of biology space. And I can give you one really simple example. If you want to study memory and cognition, the function of the brain, we've already learned something about the brain in organisms, higher organisms, and that is that it has a filter. It's called the blood-brain barrier. And we've learned a little bit about this filter. It's a filter that's probably there to make sure that chemicals in the environment that might have a deleterious effect on brain function don't get to the brain. And we've learned about the physical chemi chemistry properties of this filter with regard to small molecules. So it turns out that the charge, the net charge of small molecules is critical in order to pass through the blood-brain barrier. The net charge should be zero. It doesn't matter if you have two positive charges as long as you balance them with two negative charges. Then the molecules get into the brain. So if one of our axes is charge, net charge, everything that's strongly positive or strongly negative is going to be off limits for the swath of biology space called memory and cognition. So there's one concrete example. I don't think it's going to be easy to make this connection, but I want to finish with a little glimpse to the future. I admit this is very much in the future, but this is the challenge for all of you, and many life scientists, or those of you who might move into the life sciences for the future. So if we can roll the next and final video.
Now I've plotted for you, this is just hypothetical, this is where we'd like to go in the future. This is the subset of various small molecules, for example, within chemical space, the SMR and the rapamycin. And I'm suggesting that diabetes space may be like memory and cognition space, not uniformly distributed throughout all of chemical space. We already have hints of this, not only in the memory and cognition space, but in terms of um, other aspects of biology. Furostatin, for example, interacting with cell division space. So the molecules that are being discovered that affect certain swaths of biology are clustering together. They're not completely random from each other. And one of the very exciting goals in the future will be to link to understand the relationship of biology space to chemical, I'm sorry, the chemical space to biology space, so that scientists will be able to, in advance, synthesize molecules that take them right to the sweet spot of biology they seek to explore. So with that, I think I'll take some, hopefully, some more questions from the audience. And uh, let's see, I'm gonna try to distribute here. I have one over there. How long do you think that would take, hypothetically, to? to figure out the sweet spots and stuff? I think that, like everything in science, it's not going to be uh, an on-off switch. It's going to be a slow progression. And um, just to calibrate you where we are right now, what we want to do first is get this tool out there. So we were aiming for this public launch of ChemBank in summer of 2003, but what that really means is that ChemBank has to be interactive. So ChemBank's already working right now, but we need to make it interactive so that everyone, anyone out there in the world has something to contribute to it and contribute it and, and in, increase its value. So that's the first big step, summer of 2003. Then I think it's like, maybe not unlike the, the, the SNP measurements, it's going to be a period of time of populating the matrix to get a increasingly dense matrix. So, I think the next three or four years are going to be a, a, a rich period of, of populating that matrix. Now, what happens after that? You know, how, how effective will GenBank and its variation of SNPs and expression levels and ChemBank and its relationship with chem, chemical space and biology space, how effective will that be? How much time after that will we be able to put all this into place to actually create the new medicines to, to be able to treat disabling disease, I mean, that's a difficult one. I think uh, there's an awful lot of work out there. And one of the reasons Eric and I are here today is that we're really hoping that some of you in this audience will find some of this to be exciting uh, because we need you to ensure the progress of science. So that's a very stimulating question. There's a Howard Hughes medicine suit t-shirt and a little piece of furrow satin for you. How about Let's see in the blue sweater. How are scientists able to sort out all the different proteins to be used in the community? Well, how do we sort out the different proteins? Boy, this human genome and mouse genome sequence is very, very helpful. It, it creates, it, I tell you, it's changed the way we think about the science because just 10 years ago, there was this feeling of vast, unexplored, unending, protein space out there. It's no longer that way, it's bounded. We know what all the proteins should be because at least we think we know what all the genes are and the genes give rise to the proteins. Now there's a lot of variations of the proteins that, make, that are very important, we have to work all that out. But so the first part of my answer to your question is that the human genome, genome sequencing, gives us a kind of finite quality to the number of proteins out there. Now, what good does that do us? Well, there's a whole new area called proteomics. It's like genomics, but now all of the proteins. And one of the things, it's like uh, these new fields are gonna require the development of new technology platforms, new techniques, new higher throughput ways to gain access to the mechanism of purifying these proteins or expressing these proteins or getting them to turn on in a cell or turn off in a cell. 
And that, again, is a, a many, many labs now, many consortium of labs working around the world trying to develop those new tools. It's a great time to be very inventive in sort of developing new technology because as we can see conceptually how to do it, we just don't know mechanically the best way to do it yet. Okay? So let's give you a t-shirt here and <laughs> dwindling supply of ferrostatin. Here's your... <laughs> Here we go. Okay, let's see. Uh, we'll be even here. Uh, we'll come back over to question up top there. I was wondering how widespread is CanBank right now um, in terms of how many people can access it and how international do you expect it to okay. be? Okay, great questions. CanBank right now is being used, or I should say proto CanBank, because again, not quite ready, it's not user friendly enough. Kimbank right now is being used by a, a group of labs, about 140 of which are sharing technology platforms, some of which I've been describing for you. And we've gotten together and, and, and uh, decided and agreed upon common ways of expressing our experimental outcomes. That's a real key when you want to pool together resources. So we're thinking that we're nucleating a, a, a group. It's, you know, um, probably of those, um, let's say 80% are in the United States right now, and the remaining are, are outside the United States. We're really trying to promote more and more activity outside of the United States. Um, so, first step has been a sort of user group to, to road test this, a beta version, and, 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 and work out all of the, the glitches. The second part is that launching on the World Wide Web. Once you do that, it's available everywhere. Absolutely no restrictions. It's, as I said, you need a PC and a modem, and you gain access to it. So it's really just those two steps, working out the bugs right now. And although this first launching of it, I think, will still be in a somewhat primitive stage, it's got a lot of new components of KenBank that we need to keep building. So this requires that we bring more and more computer scientists and mathematicians into our world of science. May have time for one more question. Uh, let's see, question, let's see, the very back. Yeah. I was wondering if um, recognizing affects everybody's cells in the same manner, and if there are other small molecules besides it, if it doesn't affect everyone in the same manner, that could affect it. You could not have asked a better closing question. That's a great question, because you know what it does, just like the, the previous last question in there, it's like you just bridged our two, our two lectures. I'm talking about small molecule perturbations in cells and humans as if they're all the same, or at least you know all the humans are the same. Eric told us that we're pretty similar, but there's these one in a thousand differences, and those one in a thousand differences do make a difference in drug response. We don't know yet how those differences relate to the case of rapamycin itself, but we can draw on analogy to other drugs where there are clear differences. This is another frontier. It's in fact, I'll give you another omics. It's called pharmacogenomics. <laughs> the way in which different drugs will respond to different people based on subtle differences in their genomes. Another frontier. Once again, uh, we're, uh, I'm going to have to wrap up with that question. It was a great question to, to finish. I um, want to thank you all. You have been a terrific audience. No, you have been an amazing audience for two days here. The, the level of discussion has just been uh, astonishing. It's been very exciting. And again, we're very hopeful that some of you will find something about this world of life science that would excite you in your future, because we really do depend on you for progress in science in the future. Thank you. to thank everyone who contributed to these holiday lectures on science, both the team here at Howard Hughes Medical Institute and especially our two speakers, Stuart Schreiber and Eric Lander.